All right, so I'm making this video to uh, provide an outline for the first lab we'll be doing as part of this uh, climate change section of the class. Uh, and the reason I'm making this video is because the concepts we're talking about in this lab are so important that I really wanna make sure everybody gets it, wanna walk everyone through it. Um, and uh, you know, just given all the distance learning things that we're having to do here, uh, I want you guys to have every opportunity to, to really digest this information. So we're gonna go over basically the goals of this lab and then kind of walk you through what you're doing and why you're doing it and why it's important. So first, the first goal of this lab is to understand what's called the greenhouse effect. And so the lab itself will help us understand what this, what this thing, the greenhouse effect is. But basically the way we're gonna start off doing that is we're gonna ask these two questions. Exactly how much energy from the sun reaches, uh, oops, excuse me, exactly how much energy reaches the earth from the sun. I got sort of ahead of myself there. You, you can see I crossed myself out. So how much energy gets to the earth from the sun? So in the last, or in the uh, video 3.2, we talked about how the energy that does reach the sun is not evenly distributed, and that's how that's very important. So if you haven't watched that video, please go back and watch it now. But we wanna know exactly how much energy reaches the earth from the sun. And if we you know, ask ourselves, what should the temperature of the Earth's surface be based on that amount of energy that's coming in? So these two questions are sort of the, 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 first, the main questions at the heart of the first part of this lab. Okay, so to answer this first question of, you know, how do we, how do we figure out exactly how much energy is reaching the sun? Um, we're gonna use this sort of conceptual model that's shown in this figure here, where if we think of the sun as sort of a point source for energy, and imagine light radiating in, out in all directions from a center point. Here, I've got this little light bulb. You can imagine it's supposed to be the sun. And then here's the Earth. It's rotating around the sun. And so to figure out how much energy is reaching um, the Earth from the sun, we need to know two things. And that's basically the, the distance, uh, how far away Earth is from the sun. So that's going to be the radius of uh, Earth's orbit. I'm not sure if you can see this gray line here. Um, basically this line, R, the radius R. Okay, and so we know that that's 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. Okay, so 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters is 149 billion meters. That's a lot of meters. And it's about 93 million miles. a long way. Okay, and then the other thing we need to know is just how much energy is coming out from the sun, how bright is the sun, or its luminosity. So that's this um, uh, variable L here. And it's 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. That's a lot of watts. And the equation that's gonna tell us how much of that energy is actually reaching the Earth's surface is shown here. Basically, you've got to imagine a sort of a glass sphere surrounding the Earth and that glass, or excuse me, surrounding the sun, and that glass sphere has a radius of 93 million miles, right? So that means that all this energy, 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts, is gonna get spread out over that entire surface area. Okay, so the equation is very simple. It's the total amount of energy, 3.8 times 10 to the, minus, to the 26, divided by the surface area of a sphere with a radius of 149 billion meters. Okay, the only other trick here, the only other complexity is that the number that you calculate is going to be the amount of energy that reaches a flat surface um, 149 billion meters away from the sun. However, the Earth is of course not a flat surface, the Earth is a sphere. So this number that you've calculated here is basically, okay, how much energy would hit a flat disk? Um, but a flat disk is exactly um, one fourth the surface area of a sphere with the same radius, right? So the area of a sphere is given by four times pi times the radius of the sphere squared. And that's exactly four times bigger than the area of a disk, which is just pi r squared. Okay, so to figure out how much energy from the sun is gonna be distributed across the entire Earth's surface, right? Because of course the Earth rotates every day, once a day, we know that. 
we're just gonna have to divide that number that you calculated here by four. And that's the average amount of energy that reaches Earth's surface from the sun. Of course, we know from the albedo effect discussed in the, la the last video that not all this uh, energy from the sun uh, gets absorbed by the Earth. Some of it gets reflected uh, back out into space. However, what we're concerned with in this next part is how much energy gets absorbed by the Earth. Okay, so first of all, just, just understand that Earth absorbs that energy from the sun and it heats up. And the law of conservation of energy that tells us that energy must be conserved, right? You can't create or destroy energy. It can only be redistributed, but it must be preserved. So that means that the Earth must emit an equal amount of energy back into space, right? The same amount of energy that it's absorbing, it must also be re-emitting back into space in order to maintain this law of conservation of energy. And I should just note too that that's actually something we can measure and something we do measure with satellite data. So satellites can actually measure how much heat is being emitted from the Earth. And the value that they measure is exactly equal to the value of heat that we expect to be absorbed by the, by the Earth that we calculated in the previous part. And so in 1844, this very smart individual named Ludwig Boltzmann figured out the math that helps us understand um, this relationship between the energy or the radiation that's being emitted by an object and the temperature of that object. That equation is given right here, J with a star, which is equal to energy, is equal to this um, uh, variable sigma here, this goofy little symbol, and that's called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which was derived empirically, empirically by Boltzmann uh, and this other person, Stefan. And then T is given uh, temperature in the Kelvin scale. There's a little bit of information about the Kelvin scale uh, in this lab. Boltzmann's equation tells us that the energy emitted by an object is proportional to its temperature raised to the fourth power. All right, so we can rearrange that equation like we have down here to figure out what the temperature of that body should be. So we're going to use J, right, the amount of energy being emitted by the Earth, which we calculated based on how much we Earth expect Earth to absorb in the previous part and which can be measured by satellites. So it's going to be J divided by Boltzmann constant and then all taken to the fourth root. And that should be the temperature of a body that is emitting the amount of energy that we observe Earth to be emitting, right? So it's, the, it's what we expect the surface temperature of the Earth to be. So that equation tells us the temperature uh, that the Earth should be in this unit called Kelvin. Uh, in this part of the uh, lab, you'll just kind of convert that number to Celsius and then to Fahrenheit, which is the um, degree system that we're all used to using in the United States. Now, this is such an important concept that we give you the answer here. What you should get is an, an answer that's close to zero degrees Fahrenheit. If you don't get it when you're going through and doing this lab, please ask your TA for help. But isn't that bizarre? The average global temperature, right, that's not at the poles, it's just the average global temperature should be well below freezing. Right? Remember, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So this should be mind boggling to us, right? Why isn't the earth a frozen ball of ice? Was Boltzmann wrong? No, what we've discovered here in this lab is this thing called the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect and how that works will be covered in another video. Uh, the purpose of this lab is just to have us calculate um, the numbers, right? How we know that the greenhouse effect must be working. There must be something that keeps the earth warmer than this zero degrees Fahrenheit temperature that physics tells us it should be. Okay, in the second part of the lab, we're going to talk about how the angle of incidence, right, the angle at which um, sunlight is hitting the earth, we're going to explore just how powerful of an effect that has on the surface temperature of the earth. And we're going to do that by talking about earth's orbit and how it causes the, and how that causes the seasons.
You may be interested to learn that the Earth's orbit around the sun is not a perfect circle. It's actually elliptical. And so there are times throughout the year when the Earth is closer to the sun and times when it's further away. Um, the point in, on Earth's orbit which it's closest to the sun is called its perihelion. Peri means close to and helion just is, uh, helios is a Greek word for the sun. So perihelion, close to the sun. And then the point in its orbit orbit in which it's furthest from the sun is called the aphelion. Uh, and so that's 152 million kilometers away from the sun versus 147 million kilometers away from the sun. So in that earlier part of the lab, we used sort of an average distance from the sun to calculate how much heat from the sun should be getting to the earth. Okay, so in this part of the lab, we'll sort of be exploring, is it possible that just this difference in uh, distance from the sun, can that alone cause uh, winter and summer, right? The seasons of the earth. And so we'll be using the same equations from the first part of the lab, sort of plugging in these different values and figuring out, okay, is the distance from the sun, uh, the amount that it changes, is that enough to account for the average uh, temperature swings uh, in Amarillo between uh, winter and summer? All right. Just like in the other part of the lab, uh, I think this is so important uh, that we're going to give you guys the answer. And basically the answer is, is no, that the magnitude of the difference in Earth's expected temperature at its perihelion and that aphelion is not enough to account for the differences in mean annual temperature. Uh, this is actually data from Amarillo uh, between like January and July, right? So make sure you get that answer. And it should come as no surprise that that's not true, right? Because if we just remember that, uh, you know, it's uh, when it's winter in the northern hemisphere, it's southern, it's uh, summer in the southern hemisphere, uh, right? So it can't be, the seasons can't be caused by uh, the distance to the sun alone. But so what we'll show in this part of the lab is that that angle of incidence, right? The angle at which sunlight is hitting a surface and whether or not that same amount of energy is being spread out over a larger area, uh, or concentrated on you know a small area has a very very powerful effect on uh, the sur surface temperature of the, of that surface. So that's what we'll explore in this last part of the lab. And this has very very important implications for understanding how Earth's climate can change through time. So this is also a very important part of the lab, trying to to understand the sort of basic math behind. Um, this idea of the angle of incidence being a very important driver of the surface temperature of the Earth. Okay, so to recap, um, these are the two sort of main goals of that lab, uh, to understand the greenhouse effect, the mathematics and the physics of how we know that this greenhouse effect must be working, and then also to understand the importance of the angle of incidence of sunlight hitting a surface uh, for you know, determining the temperature of that surface. The example we provide is uh, it causing seasons, right? Winter and summer. Uh, but this, the reason we're talking about this is because it's very important, it's got very important implications for understanding climate change, right? This is gonna be one of the first things that we start to talk of when we talk about climate changing through time. So that's the lab, good luck with it. Uh, and it's very, very important for everything else that we're gonna cover. So take it seriously and good luck.